Let's take this opportunity to look at the anatomy of Homo erectus, sort of a stylized example. And that comes in this incredible reconstruction, which originally was done by Weidenreich. You might remember Weidenreich. But uh, more recently uh, redone by Gary Sawyer at the American Museum of Natural History. And it gives us sort of an idealized version of the features that are most characteristic of this species H. erectus. As we know, they're found in Java, in China, and in Africa. They have uh, a pretty heavily built skull. You can see muscle markings and so on. Uh, the, the skull bones are rather thick. Uh, they have very large brow ridges. You can see these brow ridges very clearly right here. If you feel you don't have any brow ridges. And they're offset by this little sulcus in the back. You can almost put a pencil in there. So that's that little sulcus. That uh, You have a nuchal torus, as you see here. This is a torus. It's just a ridge of bone. And it's angled like that, as you can see. It has a large, long brain case. Uh, and what's interesting when you look at the back of it, it's very wide down here where my index fingers are. In our, in our brain cases, the widest part is up here in the top, in the parietal area. Uh, there's also something interesting, and don't get this confused with the sagittal keel like in Boisei or Robustus, uh, with the sagittal crest, I should say, in Boisei or Robustus. This is a sagittal keel. Remember, this is the sagittal plane. This is actually, I didn't tell you that, but this is the coronal plane. But in the sagittal plane, there is a sort of keel that goes up there. And that's characteristic of uh, Asian erectus. Uh, and in back view, it looks sort of pentagonal in shape, has five sides to it. And in the face itself, looking at the face, it sticks out, it's prognathic, it's projecting. And there are some features in the lower jaw also, but most interestingly, in these Asian forms, you can see how the mandible, the corner of the mandible, flares out to the side. You probably have seen this in some living individuals. Uh, if you look at it in anterior view, it's very clear, as you see from this diagram, that sagittal keel. Now, why have I included this cute little hand-done, hand-colored reconstruction of Homo erectus. It's got a very interesting story behind it. There was a geologist named Bolin. Bolin was Swedish. And the uh, Swedish government sent geologists to China in the early 1900s with, under the direction of someone named Anderson. And Bolin was a member of that expedition and got very captivated by Homo erectus, or Peking man, as it was known then. And he started recreating these things. He did lots of postcard-sized drawings. He's passed away now, but I met him in 1978 in Sweden at a conference, and he presented me with this signed little copy of one of these reconstructed Homo erectus individuals, Peking men. But also, during those Swedish expeditions, several teeth were discovered of Peking man. And they were taken back to Sweden, and they are in, universe, in, in Uppsala University, in Uppsala, and they are the only original specimens of those original hominids that were found back when Davidson Black and others were there. Remember, all the others were lost, and it's those few teeth, original teeth, that reside in the museum there. Here's a good picture of the posterior view I just alluded to. You can see in the erectus at the top that it's much more angled. It has those uh, five sides to it. And uh, the breath is, the greatest breath is very low down in these temporal bones. Whereas in our crania, if you look at the back of somebody, and maybe a bald person would be most convenient, you can see that it's up here in the parietal area where you have the maximum breath. And that's a clear distinction between erectus and sapiens. Now, I was recently in Java and had uh, the wonderful opportunity, thanks to the generosity of the uh, Javan 
Indonesian scientists who are working on Homo erectus today. They're still excavating new discoveries. Uh, they're working in various places and they have these specimens carefully stored away and they were generous enough to open up the safe and show me a number of these. Uh, on the top left, you have uh, about a million year old Homo erectus, uh, saint Juren 17. It's a very roughly built and you see that it does resemble in some ways those things we call Heidelbergensis. Anyway, uh, and a three quarter view down below and on the right, you have the original skull cap that was found by Dubois, remember, in 1891, about, it's dated at about 1.4 million. Remember, we thought, when I was a student, that we didn't get out of Africa until about 500,000 years ago. This is three times as old. So we got out fairly early. And uh, down below is a child, an immature specimen, uh, about 1.4 million, and you can see already the beginning of the brow ridges. So these are things that are genetically determined. It's not because of activity and so on, it's because it's in the genes and it's diagnostic of those species. Now, these specimens look different from what we have just been looking at. When you look at this, this looks quite different in its face, doesn't it? There are some people who think that the amount of variation between those from China and those from Indonesia belong in different taxa or different species. And maybe even within Java, there are old ones at 1.4 or 1.5 million, younger ones at 1 million that might be a different species. And with regards to the postcranial bones, right, the bones below the neck, uh, these bones are very heavily built. We don't have lots of them from Java, but the ones that we have suggest that they were pretty heavily built. They had bodies of modern proportions, that is to say, relatively long lower limbs, and they must have led pretty physical lifestyles as hunter-gatherers and used their skeleton, used their bones and muscles and so on, much differently from the more or less sedentary lives that we lead as Homo sapiens. Now, there's something interesting in a site called Ngang Dong, which is sometimes, which is also on the Solo River, it's sometimes called Solo Man. These are populations of what have been called Homo erectus that last as recently as maybe 30 or 50,000 years ago. And if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you're looking down on top of one of these, that's one thing that I forgot to mention with Homo erectus. You see how constricted this area is right behind the eyes? Here are the eyes. And that area is called post-orbital, behind the orbits, constriction. And that area is not filled out. Well, in these solo specimens, you can see quite clearly here that there's very little constriction which means that that frontal part of the brain probably internally is growing and we see it change its shape to a much broader uh, frontal bone. And there are some people who think that these should be a separate species. I think um, von Koenigswald might have called them Homo solesiensis, soloesiensis. So uh, on the top right, you see one of these marvelous specimens that I was allowed to hold when I was in Java. And you, I'm pointing to the lack of the sulcus behind the orbits, but also in the back, it's somewhat angled. You have a slight nuchal um, projection there, a torus that I mentioned earlier. So it looks erectus in some parts, it looks more advanced in others. Is it a different species? Perhaps, especially because it's so much younger in time. So in terms of, of endocranial volume, the size of the inside of this brain case is what we're talking about, endocranial volume. We have six skulls from Java that average about 930 cc's, seven from Peking, which are about 1040, and the solo ones, which are 1150, the largest. And you can see in terms of the ranges, what is called erectus ranges from 813, on the lower left, all the way up, or 810, I should say, is the lowest, to the largest at 1251. 
but uh, it shows you there's a range of size which may reflect, as I said, different species differences, although you don't define species on those things uh, like cranial, endocranial volume, but they vary considerably. And uh, just to give you an idea, remember ours are about 1,400, chimps are about 280 or 380, something like that. Well, what about Africa? What do we call erectus in Africa? That's a huge discussion. Uh, there are a number of people who look at one of the most complete specimens of this broader category that some people called erectines uh, in this beautiful Turkana boy. This was a, a skeleton uh, that was found in Africa by uh, Alan Walker, who, was, uh, who is a fantastic anatomist, he found in 1984. And uh, you have most of a skeleton of a young boy, a boy that may have died around 11 years old on the basis of its teeth. And it was called the Turkana boy since it was found at Lake Turkana at about 1.6 million years. It was called Homo, it wasn't given a species, yet uh, it ultimately ended up in a species called Ergaster, which means worker because it was found with stone tools. And it was named not by its discoverers, unfortunately, but by other people who came and looked at the distinctiveness of this skeleton. Uh, there are other specimens of ergaster that take us back almost to two million years. Uh, cranial capacity of this individual was about 900 cc's and wouldn't have grown much more. As an adult, it probably would have been over six feet tall. It had a narrow lanky body, very narrow hips, a tall linear body that was undoubtedly reflecting, which undoubtedly reflected its adaptation to a very hot environment near the equator. People who live in southern Sudan today, like the Dinka, the Nuer, the Shaluk, and so on, are tall, narrow people. They have very high um, surface area to body mass ratio. So it means that their bodies are meant to be heat generators, to be living in a very hot environment. And that's what we see here at 1.6 million years ago. And it's called KNM West Turkana, Kenya National Museum's West Turkana 15,000. Uh, a very exceptional specimen. And it is thought that it lacks a number of features that uh, classic Asian erectus has. It does not have sagittal keeling that we talked about. Uh, and there are some other differences, but it doesn't have that kind of a shape to the top of its cranium. And most many anthropologists think that it belongs to a different species called Homo ergaster. There are other things in Africa, such as Olduvai hominid 9, remember that would be the ninth hominid found there, that's about 1.2 million, has about 1,667 cubic centimeters endocranial volume, has very prominent brow ridges, some of the biggest brow ridges you'll ever find in erectus. It has this classic sulcus here, C-U-S, hard to write with this pen. It has the angled, back portion or the occipital region. Uh, and some people think that this is classic erectus that came back into Africa. We always think about leaving Africa, the out of Africa experience, but certainly they migrated back in also. And uh, it is my sense that Homo erectus sensu stricto, meaning like Java and China, evolved in Asia and uh, not in Africa, but came out of Homo ergaster. We'll pick that up a little bit later. There's been a wonderful uh, cranium lacking its face, unfortunately, but with very significant brow ridges uh, and uh, from Dhaka in Ethiopia at about a million years that uh, isn't all that much unlike OH9, but has a more rounded posterior portion to it and less than 1,000 cc's that has also been put into Homo erectus. And in our next presentation, we're going to look more into the world of Homo erectus, how Homo erectus lived, where it lived, what it used for tools, and so on.